Welcome to People's Church. We are so excited that you could join us today, even though we are not meeting together physically. We've got an amazing message for you from the national leader of Assemblies of God group, Pastor Donovan Kutsi. We trust that the following message ministers into your life as we look into Jesus Christ, the resurrected King. Enjoy. Easter, what a wonderful time. Easter speaks of life, new life, of resurrection. Today we're going to look at Psalm 24, which speaks of the crown. And so far we've looked at Psalm 22, the cross. Psalm 23, the crook of the shepherd. And Psalm 24, the crown of the king. So let's uh, look together at Psalm 24. Let's read it together. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him. Who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, your gates. Be lifted up your ancient doors. That the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. So Psalm 24 deals with the King. Now Jesus is the King. Again, these are prophetic Psalms, part of a trilogy, as I've said before. And Psalm 24 is prophetic and speaks of Jesus the King. Why is Jesus described as this great king that the ancient doors and gates have to lift their heads up for and let in? Well, number one, Jesus is king because of his resurrection. Number two, Jesus is king because of his reign. And number three, Jesus is king because of his return. So the resurrection deals with the past. He has been raised from the dead, therefore he is king. He is reigning in heaven right now, present, he is reigning now at the right hand of the majesty of night. And thirdly, he will return in the future. This makes Jesus king of kings. This makes Jesus lord of lords. This makes Jesus different to any other king that has ever lived. So number one, then Jesus is king because of the resurrection. Revelation 1, 5 to 6 says, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of all the kings of the earth. Now I want you to notice the sequence there. He is the faithful witness. The, the Greek word there is martis, which means martyr. Jesus is the faithful witness who stood before Pontius Pilate, who refused to back down, who said he is who he is, and as a result of that, he died. So he is the faithful witness, he died. Therefore, he is the firstborn from the dead, it moves on, and therefore the ruler of all the kings of the earth. No other king has been raised from the dead. Jesus did not come back from the death, from dead, like Lazarus did. Lazarus came back from the dead and died again. Jesus is resurrected from the dead, never to die again. And this makes him a unique king, and he's king because of the resurrection. Matthew writes to us in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 5 to 6. But the angel answered and said to the woman, that's when she comes to the tomb and Jesus is not there. And she's all freaked out. And the angel says, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Jesus was raised from the dead. What a powerful thing. He was brought back from death. Romans 6 verse 9. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. He will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. I said it before. I'll say it again here. You see, what we need to understand here is Lazarus died, like a few others in the Bible, and they were brought back from the dead to life, only to die again. Jesus wasn't just brought back to life. He conquered death. Death had to let go of him. Death could not hold on to him. Why? Because he was not guilty. I remember listening years ago to a guy called Mike Wonky, who was a Christian comedian. And he tells the story about Jesus dying on the cross. And he says, after Jesus had died on the cross, the devil came to his two lieutenants, death and corruption. 
And he said, now listen, death, I've got him there. I've got him on the cross. Now death, I want you to kill him. And then corruption, I want you to corrupt him. Mission accomplished. I can go on a three-day holiday. After three days, the devil comes back and all hell is broken loose. The lights are on in hell. Prison doors are open. Prisoners have been set free. And the devil says, what's going on here? They say, what do you mean what's going on here? This guy, Jesus, that you told us to bring down here, he has set everyone free. He said, hey, corruption, I thought I told you to corrupt him. He said, how do you expect me to corrupt him when death was unable to hold him? Death and corruption have been defeated. Jesus has broken their power. Resurrection life isn't just coming back to life. Resurrection life is eternal life. Goes on forever and has a quality that cannot be touched by sin or sickness or disease or death. That's why Jesus is king. He is completely different. Secondly, Jesus is king because of his reign now in heaven. That's where he is right now. He's reigning from heaven. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. After Jesus came, after Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus reigns in heaven now. That's why the church is unstoppable and unconquerable. He reigns. That makes him a king. He has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. No other king has this authority. And he has this authority because he's been raised from the dead. He now is able to reign at the right hand of the majesty on high. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 27, and he says, after that the end will come, when he will turn the kingdom of God, kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power, for Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death, for the scripture says God has put all things under his authority. So when you and I, who are in Christ, we die, we don't die. Our bodies go to the grave, but our spirits go to our God in heaven. We cannot die. We have eternal life because our king reigns who has conquered death, sin, and hell. Jesus reigns right now. People may say, but look what's going on in the world. What about this coronavirus? Irrespective, irrespective of what happens to you and to me as a result of this virus or any other thing that may befall us, we know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That is the promise given to us. We have eternal life, not just everlasting life that goes on forever, eternal life that goes on forever and that has a quality about it that this world cannot give to us. And Jesus is our king because he reigns, we're in his kingdom, and we experience his reign now. Thirdly, Jesus is king because of his return one day in the future. I love this portion in 1 Thessalonians. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica and chapter 4, 15 to 18, and he says, we tell you this directly from the Lord. I love that. Paul's going, I didn't make this up. This is what God told me. I'm telling you this directly from the Lord. He says, we who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth, will be caught up in the clouds to be, meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Jesus is coming back again. I said it before. Arnold Schwarzenegger isn't the first to say, I'll be back. Jesus is the first to say, I'll be back. And he will be back. He will return. He promised he wouldn't. Why will he come back? And he tells us why. To receive his own. We're not, whether we live or whether we die, he's coming to fetch us. The dead will rise first. Then we who are alive will be changed in the twinkling of an eye to be with the Lord forever. He's coming to fetch us. He's coming to take us where he is. You saw already in the sermon, Psalm 23, that 
in his father's house are many mansions. He's preparing one for us. It's right there. It's got our name written on the door. It's waiting for us. He's coming to fetch us, to take us home, to be with him forever. This earth is not our home. We have a home in heaven. He's coming to fetch us. Secondly, Jesus is not only returning to receive us to himself, to come and fetch us for himself. Revelation 19, 11 to 13 says, then I saw heaven opened and a white horse was standing there. John in the book of Revelation describes this. Its rider was named faithful and true, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire. On his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe, at his thigh, was written the title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. Miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Jesus is not only coming to receive us, he's also coming to defeat his enemies. His enemies are those who try to frustrate the purposes of God. His enemies are those who are opposed to what God wants and the kingdom of God upon the earth. And the Bible tells us that there will be this massive day when he will come with a robe that is dipped in blood. His name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, faithful and true, with a word coming out of his mouth like a sword, and he will defeat our enemies forever. So Jesus is coming to defeat our enemies and the enemies of God. Thirdly, He's coming for another reason. He is king, and in his return, Matthew tells us this is what will take place, Matthew 25, 31 to 33. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at his left. You know, Jesus is coming to judge the world. He's coming to receive his own. He's coming to defeat his enemies. And he's coming to divide the human race. There's going to be a judgment day. There has to be a judgment day. There's going to be a judgment day that will separate the sheep from the goats. Now's the opportunity to make this shepherd who laid down his life in Psalm 22, this shepherd who leads us in Psalm 23, return for us as the king shepherd in Psalm 24. Now is the time. Today, the Bible says, while it is called today, is the opportunity that you and I have to surrender and make Jesus Christ Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So that when he divides the human race, we will be amongst the sheep and not amongst the goats. Now, not only is he coming to do that, but he's also coming to reward his people. Revelation 22, verses 12 to 13 says, Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So Jesus is coming to reward us. What a fantastic thing. And when he comes to reward us, he doesn't come to reward us just to get us into heaven. There are two, there are two judgments. There's the Bema Seat judgment and the Great White Throne judgment. The, one, the first judgment is to decide whether we go to heaven or not. The other judgment is to decide whether we get rewards or what rewards we will get. The second judgment is only for those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And one day, every one of us will stand before Jesus and everything that we've done, the way that we've lived, He will have noticed it, it will have been recorded, and Jesus will reward us for the things that we have done. It scares me a little, to be honest. Uh, you know, people see you and me as this. People think I'm this big deal or that big deal or you this big deal. But ultimately, all things are laid bare before him to whom we have to give an account, the book of Hebrews says. So one day we'll stand before Jesus, nothing to hide. 
He will see us with eyes, the book of Revelation describes, with eyes like flames of fire. And you know what? That which is not worthy to enter heaven will just be burnt up in a flash. Wood, hay, and stubble, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians. And the gold, precious stones, and silver will be able to withstand the heat of his fiery eyes. And when it is able to do that, we will be rewarded for what we have done. So we thank God that we've got a great shepherd who laid down his life. We've got a chief shepherd who equips us in this life. We don't do it on our own. And we have a great shepherd who's coming to reward us one day to receive our crowns. What a wonderful day that will be when we receive our crown from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We used to sing a little song in Sunday school in those days, when he cometh, when he cometh, to get, gather us all together. And his jewels, precious jewels, he loved and he's a... Every one of us will receive the crown that God has determined is appropriate for us. And so it's not living our lives simply before other people, but living our lives before Him. May God bless us, help us, encourage us, and let us believe what the Bible says about Him equipping us. And so I'm going to quote Hebrews 13, which is the chief shepherd. And now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, Equip us with everything which is good for doing His will. And may He work in us that which is pleasing to Him through Jesus Christ His Son. Amen. God bless you. Take care. Indeed, Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. And now we're going to take communion together as a family. And before we do that, I just want to share a couple of thoughts with us regarding communion. Communion is a reminder of what Jesus Christ did for us upon the cross. But it is also a celebration of the restored relationship we now have with God because of the sacrifice that was made upon the cross. Just want to share a few verses with us uh, from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. And this is how it reads. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ Jesus, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Paul talks about three things in this portion of scripture. First one is regeneration, that anyone, everyone, any person who is in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation. They have been created anew in Christ Jesus. That the past is gone and the new has come. And it is what the Holy Spirit does in us when he gives birth to our spirit. And the second thing that he talks about is reconciliation. He says what God was doing in Christ Jesus or through Christ Jesus on the cross was actually reconciling himself with us, the whole world, all of us, me and you. And he was, he was not counting our sins against us because he counted them upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just want to talk about the emblems of communion. The first one is the bread, which is unleavened bread. And the second one is the grape juice, which represents the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you look upon this unleavened bread, um, if you don't have it at home, you know, you can Google it or you will see it when we come back together to church. It has lines upon it and it also has holes. These play a very significant um, role when it comes to the making of the bread itself. The lines and the, and the holes on the bread, they make sure that it stays flat, that it does not rise. But also, the third thing is that it is unleavened bread, which means there is no rising agent that has been used in making this bread. And all of these three things are very sig symbolic and significant when it comes to what Jesus did for us upon the cross. The, the lines and the holes, they remind us of the body of Jesus that was whipped and that, and that had stripes upon it. And the holes, they represent the piercing of his side. This is just a reminder of what Jesus did 
for us upon the cross. And the fact that it is unleavened, when you read the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, you'll understand that leaven or yeast was actually symbolic of sin. So this means that the body and the life of Jesus Christ was a sinless offering to, to God on our behalf. So Jesus lived a completely sinless life. And that is why his offering was acceptable to God. And then the, the Jews represents his blood that was shed for us upon the cross. John uh, reminded us and also just painted a very clear picture of what happened to Jesus Christ when he was uh, making the sacrifice uh, on our behalf, both emotionally and physically. And then the third thing that Paul talks about in this uh, scripture is the recommission. He says, God has committed to us the ministry or the message of reconciliation, that we should be his ambassadors, that we should go out into the whole world and spread this message that God wants to be reconciled with each and every human being living on the earth. And so I'd just like to leave you with these two things um, as, the, as the next steps that we can take from this particular moment in time. We can be reconciled back to God. And so this speaks about your relationship with God. As you are sitting at home right now, consider the, the relationship, your relationship with God. Where, where do you stand? Where are you right now? And God wants you to be reconciled back to him. So you can make a decision right now to repent of your sins and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation and to pray a prayer of repentance to God and offer yourself and your life back to God. But also the last thing that I'd like to live with you, it is important for us to be made right with God, but it is also important for us to be made right with the people around us. I believe that reconciled people reconcile with people. And so take this time, maybe apologize for something that you did, maybe earlier today or earlier this week, or extend forgiveness to the person who may have wronged you. I believe this is what God also wants for us not only to be reconciled to him, but to also be reconciled with the people that are around us. May you have a blessed day and may you have a blessed week coming ahead.